way up. The pointer doesn't work. Um, well, we have heard a few things. Um, I will not discuss prenatal management. I will not discuss not treating it. We have just heard a few things about growth factors and indeed making vessels grow in the lungs. I think right now we already can do that. However, making functional vessels is a completely uh, different, thank you, is a completely uh, different ball game. And um, although probably it's gonna be the way to go in a decade or so, uh, right now I think the most important factor to induce growth or to induce catch-up growth, because that's what we're talking about, is increased flow. And there's a few things we can do that. We can do that either percutaneous or surgical. And there's a few items I will discuss over here. So as you can see, we can balloon, we can stand, we can embolize, we can cut, we can ask a surgeon to do the same thing, percussions, plasties, uh, unifocalize, all with varying degrees of success. What are the determinants of success? Well, first of all, we need our good building blocks. And that depends on how does the vessel wall look like, um, what is its structure going to be. And I think we all agree, if you have a patient, for instance, who has both a pulmonary atresia, but then also a bad pulmonary vessel disease, um, whatever you're going to do, it's going to be a, a disaster. The architecture must provide a flow towards the pulmonary arteries. And as we just heard, uh, flow is important. The pressure, very, very likely the pulse pressure. I mean, uh, it will be much more efficient than a similar mean pressure. And also absence of, of turbulence may be very important. The fact that flow and growth are very heavily related we know that already a long time. This is a paper from our center uh, from years ago. Uh, just depicting, if you have a patient with an ASD, the bigger the ASD, the bigger the shunt, the bigger the pulmonary vessels. Everybody knows that in congenital heart disease. What we have to stimulate, however, is the functional flow, the good flow. And so obviously anything going through the trunk must be uh, enhanced. Um, typically, uh, the ducts also will go to pulmonary trunks or the main pulmonary vessel. There's a few other things that I will discuss as we go on. Yesterday already, it was spoken about uh, embryology of uh, the pulmonary vessels. And as you all know, it comes from, I mean, the, the, the true pulmonary arteries is actual, actually uh, putting together of, of different structures. The biggest problem, however, comes from uh, these vessels over here, the MAPCAS. Uh, they may look nice at, at birth, but we all do know that some of these vessels will become a terrible uh, a pain in our neck um, because there will be uh, growing stenosis, uh, typically at the junction with the aorta and typically the junction of these vessels with the true uh, segmentary uh, pulmonary arteries. And these stenosis can become so bad that they even may occlude completely the vessels. Obviously, if there is a duct, that, uh, uh, if the duct does what it has to do immediately after birth, we lose the, the, the lung and the blood vessel uh, completely. So what decisions in our clinical man management do we have to take? Well, first of all, we have to know for every single patient exactly which blood vessel goes to where and what is it doing. Uh, we have to have a very good idea of central pulmonary arteries, and so that means the hunt for the seagull sign, or however you want to call it. Um, see how blood is going through it. Uh, we hate to see this because any increase uh, to the lungs uh, will, may cause a decrease to coronary flow, and then I'll come back a little later on the MAPCAS uh, themselves. Obviously, if you have the combination of MAPCAS with pulmonary vein problems, uh, typically that will be a disaster. What about the trunk? Well, um, if you see a trunk, it's always good news because the trunk is a late structure. Um, it may not be connected to all the segments, 
but frequently it will be associated with a duct. And it is proved that at one point in fetal life there was anterograde flow, and that actually the pulmonary atresia is what you could call a secondary in, uh, fetal atresia, but at one point there was forward flow. And in those patients, typically you will look for and try to find your, uh, your seagull because uh, these vessels have most growth potential uh, of all uh, without the nasty things that I will be dis discussing in a few minutes. However, sometimes it may look very, very nasty. Here, for instance, a patient that came to us for second opinion, and that was the cath. He came with uh, very uh, nasty looking uh, mapcas that were, was giving blood flow. Uh, I mean, there might have been some uh, pulmonary atresia. The patient came with some nice uh, CT scans, three-dimensional reconstructions. However, what you have to take into account is that these are um, um, managed pictures where the radiologist will cut away vessels or structures that he thinks are, are not very important. And sometimes it may be very, very important to go at the basic uh, pictures. And if you look carefully, indeed, in, in a patient like that, um, you can find uh, the seagull sign. Um, I think if you have central pulmonary arteries, that's probably the biggest target you have to shoot for. And indeed, in this patient, what we did was uh, go for a central shunt. Actually, this patient was declined for surgery in other centers because those central pulmonary arteries were deemed too small. And they said, whatever you're going to do, it's going to be useless. Uh, here you see what happened four months after that central shunt had been put in. Remember that the central pulmonary artery at the initial picture was no more than two, cent two millimeters, which is the same size as here the four French catheter. Uh, so it had grown. And then it's a question of managing. Uh, there were stenosis, what, which we did cut with cutting balloons. Uh, what you also have to realize is that the Gore-Tex that the surgeon uses, it can be expanded. And that means that you can give these uh, shunts a second wind. Uh, just by stenting it, it can increase in size. You can make everything grow. And indeed, a year after the initial management, we were able to go for a full repair in this patient. I'm not going to say that this looks nice, but at least it's connected. The distal pulmonary arteries uh, are there. They are rather well developed. And from then on, I mean, this patient by now, he already has a stent here and there. But I, we think we can manage, uh, keep on managing him with um, probably a, a final good result. Sometimes the problem can come from a completely different angle uh, where very, very low birth weight uh, may be a problem. And then there is another, I think, golden rule. If you can go for uh, pulsatile um, flow straight from the right ventricle, it's also worth going for. And um, practical application in this patient, if you look at his, uh, his echo images, there was an infundibulum over here, but there was a short piece of muscular uh, atresia and uh, also the valvar atresia. But that means that it was technically feasible to make a direct, a direct connection. Uh, however, nobody would like to take a, such a child on bypass. But if you could be able to puncture or whatever from the right ventricle, from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, uh, stent it, uh, take it from there. And that's indeed what we did. But again, I think you have to sometimes apply, think out of the box. Uh, what we did in this patient was um, go transventricular. Uh, we asked the surgeon, do sternotomy, and then with a needle, after the uh, purse string was made over here, he would aim for uh, the pulmonary trunk. We did use another um, needle over there to, so that the surgeon could assess at every moment exactly where his tip was. And it's amazing how easy it is then to, to reach the pulmonary uh, trunk. So here, the needle, um, we did put a clip at the level where we thought the pulmonary valve would be. Um, you put the wire in, uh, put the sheet in, you know in advance which stent you uh, are willing to use. In this patient, at this point, this is the first angio we made in him, just to see the relationship between the stent, the clip, the valve, and then it's a question of opening up uh, the outflow tract 
and I think this is a very, very good palliation with nice pulsatile flow, uh, almost even high pressure flow into the pulmonary arteries to induce growth in children like that. A typical comment will be, uh, what about the stent, can you easily take it out? Indeed, it is a little bit um, a problem uh, of taking out the stent. There is significant ingrowth of the endothelium into the stent, but don't forget, uh, this surgery here was done by the surgeon who was very grateful he didn't have to put a shunt on the, on the 1.6 kilo baby in the first place. So with some good attitude, uh, they managed to take it completely out and, and repair. Ducts are very important to go for. Why? Why? Well, typically a duct will go to a complete lung and it will insert into the lung vessel uh, of the normal functional flow. It's not a, it's not a mapka. I mean, um, uh, so if you can go through a duct or reach the duct vessel, um, you, have, um, you have a lot of uh, advantage. But those ducts and pulmonary atresia, uh, sorry, the, it, as you can see, uh, they can make nasty, nasty arrows. In the, in the frontal plane, it goes like this. In the lateral plane, it goes like this. And so typically, you will have a combined tortuous course of 270 plus 360 degrees, which is sometimes troublesome. Here you see how a simple wire, as it goes down the duct, uh, can be, become a problem. And in a patient like this here, uh, who has pulmonary atresia, if you look at uh, the, the, the way the duct goes, so it starts here from the inner curve of the aorta, goes down, goes up, comes back down. You can imagine there is not a single stent that will take all these curves. So as you take, put down your wire through it and you straighten out uh, the duct over here, you see you have a significant spasm and indeed you need some guts at that time to proceed, put in the stent, deploy the stent. I mean, you have two, one minute or so to do all this, uh, deploy it and then end up with a nicely uh, stented duct going to central pulmonary arteries have nice flow. In the meantime, this patient has evolved um, to uh, an, an, a successful Nikaido. Uh, it is in your strategy, it is very important to see these babies early because we know that um, duct in the neonatal period will close and you have to define exactly, uh, don't, don't sit back and assess uh, a week or two weeks after birth, because in the meantime, you may have lost here uh, a duct going to a single lung. Okay, we still can uh, put in wire, um, stent it, uh, regain uh, the lung. However, that lung will have been damaged. Um, at that point, it's still all too small. Don't forget that the coronary stents that we typically use for these uh, patients, you can expand them all of them up to five millimeters or 5.5 millimeters, which are big shunts. So you can allow these children to grow. And this, this child was fully repaired at the age of 2.5 years with a complete, um, with a homograph from the right ventricle and a reconstruction of the central pulmonary arteries. However, um, the main thing is the MAPCAS. Now, what do we know about those MAPCAS? I'll jump this, um, but as I said, you will get stenosis or rings. Uh, they are described as mounds of intimal tissue, and they are the structures which are the most pressure resistant that I'm aware of. I'll show you examples. Uh, jump this. Here you see an ugly looking Mapka vessel, and if you put a balloon in there, um, typically most of the vessel you can stretch easily, even at very low pressures. But then at one or two places, there will be a ring. And those rings are extremely, extremely, extremely pressure resistant. And as you could see in the old days, we went up there with balloons going up to 15 atmospheres doing nothing. And this is the same patient where a few years later, we had bigger, stronger balloons up to 25 atmospheres and still nothing. In, as a matter of fact, what we had caused over there is already a dissection of the, 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 the tissue, the vessel that was just next to the ring. You can tear it off the ring, 
So you create a, a giant dissection, and that is the perfect way to lose, actually, these vessels. Um, things have changed enormously with this here, with the cutting balloons, where nowadays we can go in the, into those vessels and cut it open, and then the dissection you create, you can stand it or not stand it. In the management of these map cars, uh, the concept of unique focalization is, I mean, is a very hotly debated issue. Um, the strategy I favor very much is the one that was proposed by uh, Frank Hanley, um, where he um, analyzes completely all the, uh, the, the different vessels. And then, very typically, and I think that is indeed a very important thing, is to slice open these mapcas almost all the way into the hylus. And the main goal, or the main thing that he will reach with that is he will cut open all the rings that are over there. Because if you do a central unifocalization, uh, which is typically done if you go from, high, from um, a thoracotomy either way, uh, you can put the vessels centrally together, but the distal stenosis, those distal rings, uh, I mean, they still can be very proximal, but there is typically also one at the hilus, you will not reach them. And as long as that ring is still there, the vessel will not grow. As a matter of fact, it, it may close. On the other hand, once you cut this open, you have to re-suture it again. And there I think one of the things that, that uh, I, um, I've seen from Frank Hanley is he probably has the world record in putting stitches in these vessels. The, the amount of stitches that he puts on the running centimeter is enormous. And these are typically surgeries that last for four, five, six hours, bypass runs of four to five hours on a beating heart just to get the things right and, and straight. This is actually one of the patients that he did treat with, you see, nasty looking uh, map cows. Um, okay, it's not undoable. Here again, you see uh, a significant stenosis that in the long run may cause trouble here, other than map cows that had uh, distal stenosis. And this, this was the result. A significant expansion of the central pulmonary arteries, actually it's, it's pericardial uh, tube. Uh, but all the different vessels have been connected. They still look very, very ugly, and there is still stenosis that must be treated and must be finished then with balloons or cutting balloons and or stents, but uh, uh, it, it, it can be managed. And I think for a lot of patients, this might be a solution. Another problem we sometimes are uh, faced with is patients where something went wrong, where a, a vessel was lost, where it was kinked. Here, for instance, the patient that was repaired early with a homograph, but the left pulmonary artery kinked off. And here you see a venous wedge injection in the patient. And the artery, very, very slowly, here the left pulmonary artery fills up like that. If you know that's a six French catheter, that means in a 14-year-old child, this is now a two-millimeter vessel. So when we're discussing uh, this patient with the surgeon of, can you make this grow? Can you put a shunt on this vessel? He said to us, well, it will already be very difficult to find a vessel. I mean, finding the vessel will, is doable because it's probably still connected to that homograft, but it's almost impossible to put a decent um, uh, a decent shunt onto that uh, left uh, pulmonary artery. But combining again, you have to think out of the box, combining then the different techniques, I asked him, well, if you can find that vessel, and if you can put a needle in there, then we can put a wire in there. But if we can put a wire in there, we can come with a stent, actually a covered stent. We inflate the covered stent, and then uh, we can bring this connection out of the hilus, and you can work with that. Then he said, yeah, but have you seen those covered stents of you? You cannot suture in those covered stents. I said, well, why don't you take then your a tube of Gore-Tex, first put some tissue call on that stent, bring the, the Gore-Tex, and now all of a sudden you can bring it all the way you want, uh, and now you have nice tissue to suture on, but you still will have to expand that stent into the Gore-Tex. And that's actually what we did in this patient. Um, here, the vessel was found. 
the covered stand uh, is inflated over here. The tube of Gore-Tex is put over it. And here is, is an, an angiogram of during the surgery. It still looks ugly, I completely agree, but we made a connection. And after a couple of months, we came back, expanded it with balloons. Uh, don't forget, it was a very small vessel to start off with. Uh, we ballooned it, and two years later, um, it had become big enough. And so we came back, and now we would put in a 10 millimeter uh, a tube on this vessel, uh, ending up making it grow. And so we, we started with a two millimeter tiny vessel uh, and ended up finally here with um, uh, going to, to the lung um, much better. Uh, what was the final result? I mean, in this patient, the price was high. Uh, two big operations. Actually, every operation was followed by an ECMO run. Six catheterization, a lot of balloons, cutting balloons, stents. But we were able to increase uh, from the saturation uh, quite a bit. I mean, this is still not far from perfect. But living with 88 is much nicer than living at a saturation of 65. Now, uh, a little final thing. You know that I will almost never come here without saying a few things on Fontans. But in, on Fontans, um, pulmonary vascular growth is of extreme, extreme importance. And you all know what is the key feature of a Fontan. Actually, by putting the lungs in between the veins and, and the heart, you create a dam, and a dam, what does a dam do? Well, upstream, it always will create congestion, and downstream, you will uh, create a controlled output, but in this situation, do understand a decreased output. And you all know that normals can increase with exercise their cardiac output, and our best Fontan, well, he would look a little bit like this, and our worst Fontan would look like this, and the difference between these two predominantly, predominantly will be determined by pulmonary vasculature. So the growth of your lung vessels or the catch-up growth of your lung vessels is of extreme, extreme importance. But as I said, growth is heavily related with flow and with output. And this cartoon here reflects how uh, pulmonary flow goes throughout life. And we all know as a fetus, there is limited flow. At birth, it will increase, and then you should have 100% of normal full body surface area. That's the normal strategy. What happens in our patients with a single uh, uh, ventricle system? Well, at birth, those patients will get a shunt or whatever, and temporarily, it will increase the, cardiac, the, the flow through the lungs. And we all know that then they will outgrow their, uh, f their shunt, and at one point we will go for a glen, but don't forget, a glen is a low pressure system with limited flow, and typically you will decrease the flow to about half at that age of its cardiac output. The patient will outgrow his glen because his head will not grow as fast as the rest of his body. Then you go to Fontaine, and typically at a Fontaine, you also you will continue to have decreased flow. Now, if you understand this cartoon, you will understand that the only time that the patient will have the possibility for catch-up growth of his pulmonary vessels is immediately after birth with his first shunt procedure. Now, if something goes wrong over there, for whatever reason, either the shunt is too small or there is a kink in the shunt or something like that, well, what can we predict? We can predict that the degree catch-up growth, because the flow is very limited, the catch-up growth will be limited. Typically, this patient will become blue fast. So people will say, well, why don't we go to the glen a little earlier? Okay, if you go earlier to the glen, so you decrease already that flow to the lungs earlier. The, the, um, they will be blue. And by the time you go to a fountain, what do you see over here? Well, you go to a fountain with a smallish, poor pulmonary vascular bed. I can predict you, sorry, I can guarantee you, this will be a bad fountain, and he will have, in time, a declining result. So that means that this poor result of your fountain 
actually is, has been created over there. Now, current strategies, sorry, current strategies are aiming almost completely to increase the blood flow through the lungs at that point. But as you all know, the best, the most potent vaso, the pulmonary vasodilators that we have, well, at best, they will increase the output 5%, 10 if you really uh, want to look at that. But these patients, they don't ask an increase of 5% or 10%. They ask an increase of 50%, 100%, 200%. So the 5% is peanuts. So probably we'll have to th rethink a little bit our clinical strategy in these patients and go back to the, the period where uh, things went wrong. First of all, the initial palliation, the first operation, is probably the most important operation of all in this patient. Doing a Glen, every surgeon can do a Glen. Doing a Fontan, every surgeon can do a Fontan. That are easy operation, big tubes, big vessels. This is very difficult. Second decision is when your patient here turns too blue and you want to go to Glen or you, you know I must do something, I think that is the second most important decision to take in, in, in our patients. What do you do at that point? And almost in every center worldwide nowadays they say, oh, we will protect heavily the ventricle because we don't want to burn out the ventricle. Uh, so we will go to the Glen. However, the final result of your fontan will be determined by the catch-up growth of your pulmonary vessels. And something we may have to reconsider is at that point do something to increase again that pulmonary flow so that we can get some catch-up growth and get your gland later, but end up with a better fontan and with a better circuit. Um, again, that doesn't mean uh, a second shunt. I mean, it may mean it, but uh, as I said, we can give a second wind to our central shunts, expand them, uh, and get some additional catch-up growth in these vessels. I agree, you will probably say, well, these look a little bit overshunted now, but to be very honest, that's what I prefer in my Fontan patients. Uh, um, the bigger the pulmonary vessels in a Fontan, I think the better clinical result we will see in these patients. I thank you for your attention. All right. Uh,